Today I wanted to uh, answer a few questions. Many questions have come across from the last handful of videos I've posted. And if you have questions about something, genuine questions um, about um, a particular line of thinking or explanation that you'd like to see, um, let me know. If I don't know the answers, then I'll dig and I'll try to find somebody who does and I'll try to figure it out. One of the ones that, that have come up, and I'm trying to answer them in some studies on Matthew, which you know are down below if, if you look, depending on how you have your, your browser set up and your YouTube set up, probably down below um, Matthew, um, is Matthew 24 um, in the Olivet Discourse, which is chapters 24, 25, and actually the first verse or two in Matthew 26. So it goes on a lot longer than what most people think or pay attention to. So I'm trying to answer some of those. So I'm doing a real quick run through. Uh, that sermon, the famous sermon, the Olivet Discourse. So uh, the other thing I want to cover is, remember this, I had just kind of uh, scrawled this out and I was asking calendaring questions and I'm getting many challenges regarding the uh, calendar. And I just want to say that that was not my intention at all, was to fix a date. This is exploration. And uh, the reason why is because there are so many posts out there that say where a date will work and where it won't, and signs and things about asteroids coming in and the eclipse and so forth. And uh, whether those things matter, I'm just looking for calendar software. And so that was my questions. And I'm looking for timing on these things from what I know from the book of Revelation and how they might fit. And if you look down at the lower left, 2023 out to 2030, and how these events might fit there with the number of days. And I'm also looking at um, how those might fit from 2024 to 2031. That's the only honest way to do it. Um, 2025 to 2032. What I'm trying to do is introduce that because people asked. So here we go. There's a digitized version of the same thing, my same thoughts, basically, and they put down in digital form. So we will um, get into that. But before we get into that, um, what I would really like to do is answer another question another line of thinking okay we've all we've all heard this now i'm going to put it this way and i'm getting many challenges any anytime you know i i posted the graphic that i showed you before and i will put it back up again and we'll talk about it walk through it a little bit and i'll try to explain myself um without even watching the video um reading my comments or anything people just pop into the room real quick, pop in underneath the video and type, no man knows the day or the hour, and then leave. Um, and obviously that's not even the line of discussion. Frankly, and this is the thing I've been pointing out, is that um, we should be watching Titus 2.13, looking for the glorious hope and uh, the... Uh, great appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I, I'm getting like two or three different versions <laughs> uh, mixed up here. I'm used to King James and New King James. I'm used to ESV, LSB, and now they just all swim around in my head. So we look, we watch. Jesus commanded, watch therefore. He gave all these signs and he, he gave the imperative, watch therefore. So it's our command to watch. Um, and at the same time, people say, well, no man knows the day or the hour. Does that mean we're not supposed to watch? Jesus castigated the Pharisees for being able to rise up in the morning and know by the color of the sky what the weather was going to be like, but yet they did not recognize the time of their visitation, which, which he meant now, standing before them at the, uh, first, at the first coming. Now learn this parable from the fig tree when its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves. You know that summer is near. So you also, when you see these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So, the hot debate, the big debate. As I pointed out in the 
previous chapter, chapter 23 of uh, Matthew, Jesus does refer to this generation as a specific pe people. And he's talking to these Pharisees who um, he has many pronunciations of judgment upon. And he calls them this generation, you generation of vipers, that kind of a thing. So he's speaking to a specific people. And then we come over here and folks try to say every time Jesus uses this generation that it's always talking to a specific people. And that's what it's about. This generation, when he means this generation, he means this generation. Well, okay, let's argue that this generation he's talking about a people. I'm fine with that. That's fine. But they say he means this generation as in the generation that was alive at the time. Contextually, I maintain, when the conversation started with, with Jesus, they left the temple that he and four of the disciples went up on top of the Temple Mount. And um, I have this up on my screen, so, so let me take, take a look here. They asked this kind of threefold question. Tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So Jesus is ad addressing these questions and he's answering them in order. It's a marvelous thing when you, when you read the Olivet Discourse, Jesus refers to the end and his second coming in so many different terms, some 13 times. So he's talking about the end times. He's talking about the end. No one there is he talking about um, 70 AD. He, t he mentions the end and his second coming 13 times. And it says immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of heaven will be shaken, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end to the other. And then this gentleman who was debating him says, that did that happen? Demar said, yes, of course it did. This happened. And he means, of course, he's going figuratively. And that's where they always run. It's like, it's like uh-oh, this text doesn't work with my, uh, my paradigm. Where's my magic wand? Being symbolism. And so they want to wave the magic wand of symbolism every time um, the truth impacts with their pet theology. And that's what he's trying here, and it's, it's, it's absurd. I mean, it takes so much faith to believe that. What are the rules for determining something is symbolic? I guess the rule is, well, if it messes with my theology, it's symbolic. What if somebody comes along and says that the cross is symbolic? You know, the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses will say that the, um, the uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ was spiritual. It was spiritual. It wasn't a physical resurrection. It was spiritual. And, he, and here's my other question about this, um, Mr. DeMar. Riddle me this. Which of Jesus' um, prophecies or prophecies concerning Jesus at his first coming, all the prophecies of the Old Testament, how many of those were fulfilled spiritually, not literally? Can you think of one? Just down below, shoot me an answer if you have one. Somebody. Because I can't think of a single one that Jesus did not literally fulfill every single prediction. But all of a sudden, we're going to come here, and because it collides with somebody's pet doctrine or theory, we're going to say, oh, it's spiritual. It was a spiritual thing. There's no precedence for this in Scripture. So it was right to, to um, challenge him on this, because none of these ha things happened in 70 AD. So, um, so we have this generation... And I've always maintained this generation means um, the generation that sees all these things come to pass. Um, uh, surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. So 70 AD wasn't it. He wants to shoehorn it into there and try to say that this generation was it. So what we are doing here is it's kind of odd that we want to try to shoehorn this generation that Jesus is making a prediction that it was going to happen in the generation they're standing in, but yet at the same time, people will turn around and say, but of that day and the hour no man knows, um, nor the angels of heaven, my father only. 
the sun is also mentioned in here in many texts, so not even the sun knows. Um, so if the sun doesn't know, how does he know that that's the generation back in 70 AD, the first century? Does the sun know? Or does the sun not know? So we're having him make a prediction that it was going to be in the first century, but yet no man knows the day or the hour? You can't have it both ways. Um, so he's what Jesus is speaking of here, as he's answering their questions, and like I said, several times, he is naming um, the end or the second coming, um, at least 13 times in here, at a quick cursory read-through. And he's talking about the tribulation and uh, all these events going on um, and, and um, the abomination that makes desolate and so forth, the abomination of desolation. One of the other things he says in here, that at this time, let's just go from there. For then, there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. So, if 70 AD was it, did Jesus lie, uh, Mr. Damar? Or was he simply mistaken? When we look at this, we see that both world wars were worse than 70 AD. As horrific as 70 AD was for Jerusalem, and some, some people reckon that there were a little bit north of 1 million people died in Jerusalem at that time. That does not match World War II, 6 million Jews, and what happened all over the whole world. So which is it? Because Jesus is saying here, for then... There will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. The only way to interpret this is it's sometime post both the world wars. That's going to be a worse time than that. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Ah, that's right. It's symbolic. It'll symbolically be worse. It'll spiritually be worse. I years ago thought and considered some of these things. I grew up in kind of a mixed church when I first came to know the Lord back in the days of the Jesus movement. Um, and uh, it was in 1971. And I kind of heard both sides. And um, sometimes you'd have a couple people, the pastor and, um, you know, somebody else, a couple other people might be up at the front of the church, you know, and there'd be a sermon. And then these discussions will start. And it's a great time to go sit up there, post yourself up and listen if you're young and you're new and you're and you're growing and you're maturing and you're you're wanting to learn more, you listen to these discussions. And so I was like watching a tennis match between these two and learning and absorbing. And so then get it, you get in and you study and you figure out um, after a lot of study that there are a couple of different ways of thinking. So you've got to pray about and seek the scriptures and figure out which way um, makes the most sense while having a consistent hermeneutic. The other factor that informs um, how to understand this passage and other prophetic passages is the phenomena of uh, gaps in uh, prophetic fulfillment. See, a lot of times there are prophecies and they are forecasts of something that's coming, um, and there's a near fulfillment that is kind of a foreshadowing of the ultimate big fulfillment that's to come. And... Um, a lot of times people have trouble with this, will argue the point, and they will even sometimes mock, you know, the 70 weeks of Daniel and the idea that that 70th week that we call the tribulation week, um, that it is going to be, you know, roughly 2,000 years and counting or whatever. Um, actually, from Daniel's time, much more than that, right? That it's way out there in the future and it hasn't hasn't happened yet so why is this prophecy all split up well and then i like to point out a couple of examples would be in the birth of christ one is that um gabriel when he approached mary he informed her of what was coming with her um, pregnancy and who her son would be and then tells her that one day he will sit on the throne of king david he will sit on David's throne. Is that not a 2,000-year gap? Jesus didn't do it the first time. He's going to do it in the future. Jesus did the same thing in Luke uh, chapter 4 when he opens up the Isaiah scroll and he's reading that. 
and he stops at an implied comma with a prediction about the coming Messiah, and he pauses right there, and he rolls up the scroll, and he says, this day, is this fulfilled in your hearing? And everybody was kind of confounded, like, wait, that's a weird place to stop. Because the rest of the prophecy, prophecy from Isaiah concerns the things Messiah would do at his second coming. So there's a 2,000-year gap. So these things are replete throughout Scripture. Okay, so here is what I've discussed before. And if you look out over here, um, I had come to the conclusion and I was asking for help on how to software this out and figure it out because if the autumn equinox is September 22nd, the first fall moon is October 14th and 15th. And I was maintaining um, off over here to the right that that's how it should be is that the um, really Yom Teru should be up there in October. Now, here's how this plays out. When, when the priests run out and verify um, a full moon or a new moon, let's say a new moon, like right after the, the uh, vernal equinox, the spring equinox, um, they will verify that, okay, this is the, the first of the year, the, the real first of the year in the springtime, biblically. So from there you count. Then when you get to the fall feast, it's seven months out. But the calendar is off. And I think it's really, it's, it's probably too far off to really unpack all this, unfortunately. I hate to say it, but it's true. They've they ch changed the calendar calendar at least um, th three times the, the yearly calendar. They've messed that up. The weekly calendar has been changed too, the days of the week. And, and many people don't realize this. So when you try to count backwards in, in uh, NASA software, it assumes that the days of the week have always been the days of the week that they are now. And they, they I don't know what, I don't know, they might have software, a way of changing it to where it'll correct and show you where that change happened, you know, whatever, 325 AD and show you where it happened. Um, but the days of the week are off too. So um, folks who think they're, they are um, observing the Sabbath on the same Sabbath as Jesus and the disciples in the first century, I hate to disappoint you, but you're not. Um, if you want to, Observe the Sabbath on the same day as Jesus and the disciples, you would have to do it on a Tuesday because the calendar got messed up by three days um, in 325 AD. Um, so when some people will try to do the math and figure out the future and when Jesus is coming, they'll see this at 2030 AD and they go, oh, good, let's see. So if we do this math and we bend and think of it this way, the math could come out to where Jesus was, uh, you know, concluded his ministry in um, 30 AD. So we could pick that date as 30 AD. And uh, because Jesus was not born, you know, at this time, he was born that time, and this calendar is messed up. So we're going to, and then play around and fudge and change just one of the numbers, not all the numbers. So it comes out to 2030 will work out really great because it's 2000 years later than 30 AD. And that's not an honest way to do it either. Now, um, we don't know how long ago 30 AD was or 32 AD or whatever, because our calendar is messed up on the order of at least, you know, minimum a year, probably more like two or three years, the calendar is messed up. That's how when you look in most history books, you have Jesus born before Christ, BC. How is Christ born before Christ? Because well, they've messed up the calendar so much and they did it. They did it once and they did it twice and they did it a third time just to really mix things up. So, um, as far as calculating out dates and things and trying to figure out exactly the day Jesus was crucified and exactly when pa Passion Week was and all this, you know, it ain't gospel. We can't, can't nail it down exactly. So th this is what I was looking at as far as the time indicator. So, um, you know, people will try to say um, that no, the autumnal equinox um, was never factored in to correct and adjust the calendar. Well, here's the thing. 
before the flood, we have date indicators to point this out. We can go back to Genesis, Noah, we can count things out when Noah got in the ark, when he com came off the ark, and so forth. So we could calculate out 30 day months, 12 of them for 360 days. After the flood, all bets are off because the shape of the earth and the mass internally and everything else and upheavals with um, mountains and so forth and the valleys and how the water shifted um, and how the vapor that used to be a water vapor canopy on the outside of the planet uh, before the flood, the windows of heaven were opened and all that moisture condensed and fell into the earth and added mass and weight to the earth. So now, um, and it didn't take them long in the Old Testament even to figure out that, well, we're, we're off, you know. So if you, if you go by strictly solar, you have a 365 and a half day year and everything's off a little bit. So what they used to do back then is occasionally they would adjust the calendar to um, try to keep it on track. I'm, I'm still trying to research and get definitive and with the process of what they did to um, keep adjusting the calendar to keep it on track. That it would have been a good idea to go by the equinox. And this is how the position of the sun when it passes the equator. And it does this as this, the planet rotates around the sun and the Earth's at an angle. So the equator with the ecliptic plane uh, related to the sun is where you get the equinox. So you've got the vernal equinox in the spring and the autumnal equinox in the autumn, in the fall. So we know positionally in space where the planet is in relation to the sun and, and all this kind of stuff, and the moon comes into play, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. At the same time, um, what we have in the Pentateuch is God giving directions on how to observe um, when harvests are, when moons begin and so forth, not moons, months begin by looking at the moons. So you would have the first of the year, Nisan, start off with the new moon, the first new moon after equinox. That's the first. And then you have, you have the first full moon after that. And of course, that is Passover week. And then, so you go, okay, that's the first month. The seventh month, then, that's when you get into the fall feasts. Well, what they've done is because there's so much drift with the calendar, is then in about the, the 200s, they changed the Hebrew calendar. So now you've got like a 19-month period, and you add in an, an additional month of Adar in certain years, seven times within that 19-year period. And I'm looking at this kind of going, well, they should have done that this year. And the reason why I say, well, they should have done that this year, I don't know how they arrived at, let's do it this year and on this year and on this year and this year. How they de decided to do that, I haven't read how they made this determination that let's do it on these years. I don't know if they pulled a number from a hat or if they were doing any math, but it seems like it should have happened this year. Okay, why? Because it works out okay when you go from the um, spring equinox and you count down seven months. They, they did this quickly as far as the first new moon does kick off the first month on the Hebrew calendar, Nisan, correctly. Okay, go down seven months and what we should have had now is Tishri, which should start, as I've got indicated here, October 14, 15, somewhere around there. Now they are correct in saying that, well, seven months away is about the 17th uh, thereabouts of September. That is seven months away, but there's, it's still summer. We're, we're still in summer. It's not fall until we get into some um, fall begins September 22nd. So it's a few days after they're celebrating Yom Teruah this year. So if they're going to add an additional month of Adar to correct the, for the calendar, it should have been earlier this year because now what we're doing is we've – Got an adjustment that didn't happen, and really it should have been October 14th, 15th. From my observation, and this is where I'm ignorant about a lot of things, and I'm still learning. So this is why I was trying to ask about calendaring software. I'm not setting dates. I'm trying to say, well, why, why will I keep going on 
and 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 looking at this 2023 date I have here in 2030, and then try adjusting the calendar and trying to figure out how these things fit from this period to that period. As it is in this period right here, 2023 to 2030, you've got three more um, leap years going on. So you're adding another 93 days in that period. So why go on with the software and try to figure out and calculate things? Because I thought it'd be fun if I could figure this kind of stuff out. There are some interesting intersections going on here. Look in the middle, April 7th. Now, if the, um, the number of days in here, the 1260 days, does not reach, does not extend all the way from one end to the other. Why? Well, because we've added in these leap months, these leap years. So in a, a real calendar that looks more like the Old Testament calendar, they would probably fit because it fits for 360 day years. So this is the problem. So there's a little bit of slop in here, but what fits right in the middle is this uh, April um, of 2027 20, year. And if you've got uh, this little bit of period here, right in the middle here, where it says Nissan 1 will start on, on April 7th of that year. Well, that matches up with Revelation 12. Michael stands up and kicks Satan down, and in his anger, he gets kicked down the earth. And so he goes and he possesses Antichrist. He goes after the two witnesses, goes into the temple, desecrates the temple, and goes after the woman and pursues the woman, Israel. Um, and she must flee and run into the hills where she'll be nourished for a time, times, and half a time, or um, for 1260 days, it also says. So it gives it in two different ways. So here's where the slop happens. There's a lot of wiggle room in there. So trying to come up with something definitive and how this works out has been problematic. That's another way that this is, you know, no man can know where the day or the hour, even if we know the season is because it's the calendar. Today's calendar is just too sloppy. Prove me wrong. Um, however you count it out, there's, there's some slop, there's some give in it and, and you can't, you can make it work. And I've, put in here lines and suggestions on how that might work out. If you want to do a screen, screen grab, you can do that. You can do this real quick so you can do that again. Um, but you've got trumpets and how long it lasts, uh, atonement and how long that lasts, and tabernacles and how long that lasts and so forth. So again, you've got some, some slops and things going in there. You've got you can have the tribulation not start immediately at the rapture and you got this this 10 days period where you can have the day of atonement yom kippur kicks off and and, and this happens a lot of times when the enemies of israel attack israel they'll do it on one of these holy days so i could see gog and magog i could see that whole thing happen um on yom kippur the day of atonement boom they're going to go and there's going to be a reckoning and they're going to go after israel and, of course, it's going to be a short-lived war. They won't even make it down fully into Jerusalem. They'll attack Jerusalem, but the armies won't even make it all the way down because Gog himself is killed, destroyed on the hills outside of, of uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and so armies are destroyed up there in the hills. We see fire and brimstone coming down on them. So um, God's going to take them out before they get all the way into Jerusalem and deserate, deserate decimate. God is going to get in there and um, take them out before they get an opportunity to completely decimate Jerusalem. So that'll be a short-lived war, and you got to have a certain number of times, according to Ezekiel 38 and 39. Ezekiel 39, the time for burying the dead, which is, comes out to about 210 days, and seven years, or 2,300 days, um, you got Daniel 8, 13 and 14. That's another measurement going on. But the time to for the burning of weapons is will be 2,520 days, seven years burning the weapons in Ezekiel 39. And that can't go all the way into the kingdom period. Jesus isn't going to want weapons burning into his kingdom period. That's another way that we know that Gog and Magog is not the same way as Armageddon because Armageddon is at the end and Jesus will not permit the burning of weapons for power to go on it 
you know, several years into his kingdom, he doesn't need it, wouldn't want it. That's just uh, talk about a nasty carbon footprint in the, in paradise on earth. So it's going to kick off really soon. So these these are the things that um, I've been looking at. So um, this has gone on long enough. I'm going to stop this here. But um, anyway, the calendar still messed up. You see my chart. It's been digitized because some people ask. If it helps you, great. If you come across some helpful, useful information that I can actually apply and use um, somewhere, fine. But um, I would like to be able to project out, forecast out, and see where some of these dates for the math lines up correctly and in what year. All right, that's all for now. Thanks. Uh, drop down your questions. Please subscribe so that you can be notified of any more. Feel free to ask questions if there's anything in particular you feel like I'm missing that I you would like to hear from me on um, scripturally as far as how some of this plays out. I like I, I want to caution you. I, I don't like to play fast and loose with scripture. I like to be very exact wherever I can. Um, forgive me if you find a place where it looks like maybe I did play fast and loose, but um, I'm very careful where Scripture is concerned. And I, I, uh, I highly value Scripture and the source of it, so that is the way I approach it, very carefully. If Scripture is silent on the matter, then I feel like we ought to be silent on the matter as well. That's where I stand. Bye.